And with that, it is time for Ellen Class from RGP to join us. And we have a relatively unique session for you this hour in comparison to all of our lease accounting sessions that we've done historically. Helen is going to talk to us about identifying fraud in the accounting world. So without further ado, Ellen, thank you for joining us. And I will go ahead and pass some of the controls over to you in regards to the presentation deck. And with that, we will also pass the microphone over to you and you can go ahead and get started. Excellent, thank you so, got, so much guys for the introduction, I really appreciate it. As they mentioned, this is gonna be slightly different from some of the other topics that we've discussed, but I am hoping to touch on fraud as it relates to a couple of lease items which they've been reviewing in the prior sessions. Okay, how to identify accounting fraud. And this is our agenda. So we're gonna talk about what, defining what accounting fraud is, the enemies within, detecting fraud, preventing fraud and internal controls, and then finally some global considerations because more and more of us work for global countries. They may have a US presence, but they also may have facilities, offices, locations around the world. So this is a very deep and wide topic, and I'm only going to be able to touch the surface on most of these items. You could literally spend hours learning about detecting accounting fraud. Um, I do like to start the presentation with my favorite slogan regarding accounting fraud, and that is, fraud is the second oldest profession in the world. If there is money, there is money to steal. Okay, defining accounting fraud. So this is the crux of the issue. It's very, very wide ranging. Internal fraud is also called occupational fraud, and it can be defined as the use of one's occupation for personal enrichment through the deliberate misuse or misapplication of an organization's resources or assets. So this type of a fraud generally occurs when an employee, manager, or executive wrongfully or criminally deceives their organization. The two main examples of occupational fraud are embezzlement of cash, um, which you don't really think about much anymore because there isn't technically cash associated with many businesses. That could also mean not charging friends or family for the service or product that your company offers and fraudulent payments. So I have an example of this in my backyard, unfortunately. I'm in, I'm in the San Diego area, and we recently had a fraud involving a local cabinet maker where a long-term employee stole almost $12 million worth of cash and assets over years and years and years. And this employee was both the accountant, the bookkeeper, the front desk person, clearly no segregation of duties. In the end, she was caught. Um, since it's a private company, I don't think there was any auditing involved by um, public auditors, but it's an example that fraud can occur at almost any business at any level. This is the famous or infamous fraud triangle. So anyone who's involved in um, accounting or potentially is involved in fraud accounting or forensic accounting would be familiar with this triangle. Um, starting, this was developed by Donald Cressy in 1973. So his concern at the time, he's actually a criminologist. He wasn't necessarily associated with accounting or with this type of fraud, but his concern at the time was not only how can we identify what the fraud is, but what were the underlying root causes that allowed it to happen? And how do we use those to help stop that fraud in the future? So starting from the lower right-hand corner, um, we have pressure. So this is financial or emotional forces pushing towards fraud, including personal financials, um, work problems, unrealistic sales targets. Those are those kind of things that seem to impact employees and lean them towards the possibility of committing fraud in order to achieve those items. In the top, we have rationalization, which is, of course, here the justification of dishonest actions. Um, it's thought 
by people who commit, who think about rationalization, that the gain is more important than getting caught. And it's often used to justify why someone would want to commit fraud. So the company doesn't pay me enough. They have a lot of money. They're not spreading that out to the employees. So there's lots of rationalizations that go on in the fraudster's mind. And finally, at the lower left, we have opportunity, which is the ability to execute the plan without being caught. Um, it, the person, the fraudster or the group of people identifies internal control weaknesses and doesn't believe others will notice if the person or the group takes the money. Often, this starts out small, something that would never be caught under normal circumstances. And then because they get away with it, it then goes, increases in size and sort of becomes a reverse Ponzi scheme where it starts little and gets big. Just to be aware, all three of these, pressure, rationalization, and opportunity, have to be present for the fraud to occur. One hint here is that when I'm conducting a forensic or fraud audit, um, I often arrive at the client's or the customer's parking lot very, very early. And I literally look for the people who are driving really expensive cars. Um, I'm hopeful that it's not the accountant or the CFO, but that's just one realistic way that you can maybe identify possible targets is based on what they're driving into the parking lot for work versus what they normally would you would normally see or expect. So there are essentially three types of occupational or internal fraud. The first one, which most people are very familiar with, is asset misappropriation, where third parties or employees in a company or organization abuse their position and steal through fraudulent activities. The second one is corruption, where users influence a, tri a transaction. Maybe they bribe someone, they're trying to benefit themselves, they may have conflicts of interest, and this is normally carried out by senior management, managers, and owners. So for management, things like the backgrounds of people, what their motivation might be to commit um, corruption or asset appropriation fraud, influence in making decisions, right? So the managers, senior managers, and owners, those are the people who generally have more influence in decision making within the company. And finally, a key symbol for this is turnover. If there's lots of turnover in senior management or management, that might be a clue that something inappropriate is going on. Often these are the folks who have their personal worth tied up in the company. They may have stocks or stock options or stock grants or huge amounts of outstanding stock if it's a public company. They also may be people who have been saddled with unrealistic expectations. And we actually saw this as last year's COVID crisis was coming into being. There are some companies that actually did not adjust sales targets for their employees. And of course, the year sort of fell apart for most businesses. So that's an example of an unrealistic expectation given the circumstances that might um, help promote fraud or occupational fraud. And then finally, financial statement fraud, which is the, dis the deliberate misrepresentation of the financial condition of the enterprise, either through misstatement, through omissions, or through disclosures, which are designed to deceive investors and stakeholders. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit more in depth about asset misappropriation, which is the first of those three categories. I think before you can detect fraud, it's important to understand the components of fraud, what makes up the different types of fraud, because that will guide you in what you need to do in order to be able to detect or prevent these kinds of fraud. So asset appropriation, misappropriation, excuse me, includes cash and disbursements. It includes inventory and all other assets, and it includes larceny. So those are very, very general buckets. Um, I have been able to detect a fraud actually in cash and disbursements. I used to work for a giant bank 
And one of the rules of banking is that people have to go on vacation for a year, excuse me, a week at a time during a year. You can't take like a Monday off and then a Friday off. You are required to go in a consecutive week of vacation at a time. And so if someone is committing kiting or lapping, where they are moving money between checks that have a longer float time between two different banks and then deposit it in their banks, that if they're out of the enterprise, out of the bank's office for, a, for more than a week, that can actually be caught because they're no longer making deposits into their account. And one of those checks will actually bounce. And so that's exactly what happened. Um, this is a large nationwide bank and they had a teller in the merchant cage who was lapping or kiting checks, relying on a two or three day clearing cycle through the Fed clearing houses. And they were caught while well on vacation it was very apparent what was going on as we started looking at the person's account balance, but that never would have been caught if the bank didn't enforce that those employees need to be out for a week at a time. Um, as far as some of these items, including disbursements, they help um, identify possible avenues. So one of the things that we've seen potentially in fraud is comparing vendors' addresses to employees' addresses. So there is some software available to do that. I don't recommend for a large company that you try to do that manually. As they were talking in the last presentation, that wouldn't make much sense and be an effective use of your time. But even just a basic comparison of your employees' addresses versus vendors' addresses might uncover uh, disbursement. It also might uncover larceny because maybe your company's products aren't being shipped to you from your vendors, maybe they're actually being shipped to the employees for their use. So that's a good example of that. Um, when you're doing that type of analysis, it's important that you consider all of the ramifications of spelling. So road might be R-O-A-D in one file and it might be R-D in another file. That's super important. And also segregation of duties to prevent one person from both selecting the items that are gonna be paid, um, paying those items, and then eventually approving that payment of those items or the checks. Um, so segregation of duties is really important here. So you have that good double check. Um, of course, larceny or stealing is a fraud where I've seen a couple of these, one in which the manager broke up the level of the POs to get below an approval threshold. So they could approve up to $50,000 a purchase order, but above that, they needed additional approvals. And what they did was they just split a hundred or $200,000 purchase order into smaller chunks so that it would never rise above that and it would stay within their delegation of authority. I've also seen ordering a million dollars worth of custom cabling when maybe they needed $10,000. And that cabling actually ended up in a third party warehouse and the company was committed to buying that cabling where there was absolutely no use for that in their fraud schemes. So now we're going to talk about types of corruption, which was the second element that we uh, considered in terms of types of fraud. So collusion with the vendor to make false payments for goods or services which were never delivered. Um, collusion with a healthcare provider to create false health insurance claims, kickbacks in which an employee receives a bribe or a payment from a third party in exchange for business, um, business advantages like sole source contracts, um, product substitution in which the employee in your company colludes with the vendor to instead of delivering the quality or the specific product that was requested delivers an inferior or a lower or counterfeit goods quality instead. And finally, bribery, in which um, vendors bribe or purchasing officers or other people in the, in the business for personal gain or advantage. So there's a whole list of types of corruption that fall into this. One of the other items, and this relates to the second bullet, is um, ghost employees or fictitious employees. So this can sometimes be seen in other countries, potentially in the US, where friends and relatives of the plant managers or the purchasing manager or the HR manager get hired on. And in fact, they're not, they don't really exist. They're trying to get free benefits from the company. Maybe they're trying to get a payroll check, 
but they never report into work. So I've seen a couple of instances as that as well. And the last one, and probably the one that most people are familiar with because of the huge accounting scandals that we've seen in the last uh, 15 or 20 years is financial statement fraud. That includes falsifying sales record, and that is the single largest source of financial statement fraud is revenue recognition or sales recognition being inappropriate. Um, postponing expense, expenses, until later in the period so that earnings look higher or moving them from one period to another. And finally, inflating the value of assets, off balance sheet assets, leases. Um, and this is the area that I wanted to talk a little bit about some fraud related to lease accounting, which was the topic that was covered earlier. So when someone is doing the lease accounting analysis, a potential area for fraud is um, if there are items that are off balance sheet, if there are leases that are not readily available or apparent as a lease, um, the determination of the lease rate, all of that lease accounting requires rate determination. So how is that backed up? Is that a reasonable rate for the company? Um, what is the source of that rate? That is a potential area of fraud when doing that calculation. And finally, not including all possible leases. And I think this is the biggest area of exposure. Um, people often forget about embedded leases um, or looking for embedded leases in your copy rentals and other things. So excluding possible leases and looking for embedded leases is really the third area where if you're investigating fraud, you may wanna take a look at with regards to specifically lease accounting. Okay, first polling question. Do you think there is internal or occupational fraud within or involving your organization, company, or employer? So the options here are yes, no, and not sure. Um, regardless of how you answer, in my view, I believe that 100% of organizations have some type of fraud. Uh, it may not be material. Um, it may not affect um, financial statements in, in a material or large way. But I'm of the opinion, maybe because I spend a lot of time investigating fraud, that in virtually any company, you can overturn a rock and you can find fraud. And just want to remind everyone that it's important that you answer this so that you can get your CPE at the end of the session. And then hopefully we'll look at the results after everyone chimes in. Whoops. Yes, 10%, no, 65%, and not sure, 24%. So I'm pretty surprised about the 65%. Hopefully by the end of today, we will, or my session, you'll think of all the op opportunities for fraud that maybe you hadn't considered when you answered that question. Like I said, I really do feel that in 100% of organizations, enterprises, companies, nonprofits, there is fraud that exists on one scale or another. Okay, my next section is the enemies within. This is super important to understand because you, you understand who's committing fraud, right? And what the opportunities are for them to commit fraud. You can put in preventative measures that might head it off at the pass. And some of these are very easy and straightforward, don't cost a lot of money, but for some reason, companies don't seem to consider those when they're setting up their systems. So organizationally, 42% of employees, staff or contractors um, commit fraud. 38% managers and 18% owners and senior executives. In terms of the mindset, the latest survey says that 5% of people within a company would commit fraud no matter what. 85% would only commit fraud in certain specific circumstances. And 10% would never commit fraud under any circumstances. So this tells you that there's a large group of people that is predisposed to committing fraud, either with regards to specific circumstances or in general. 
And I like the last item on this slide quite a bit. Research indicates that 54% of fraudsters are between the age of 31 and 45, and that only 3% are over the age of 60. So if I was being facetious, I might tell you, you need to hire employees who are over the age of 60. I qualify in that bucket, and it's good to know that I am not going to be committing fraud based on my age. Okay, warning signs or red flags. So one thing about this slide is this slide was actually changed by the conference providers. These bullets should actually be red because these literally are red flags. So I apologize, it makes much more of an impact if the red flags are actually red flags. So some warning signs are employees who live beyond their means, 44%. Um, that is the perfect example of why I pull into a parking lot very, very early before employees get there and start looking at who is driving what kind of car, looking for high value cars or cars that seem out of line with that person's position and responsibility. Financial conditions, 34% of the reason given um, for committing fraud. Close association with a vendor or a customer, often familial, but it could also be a relationship from a professional organization, someone they've done business with in the past. Control issues, or maybe we should call this lack of control issues or lack of internal controls. Uh, wheeler dealer attitude, someone who's very casual about their job, who's sort of like someone you always see as the epitome of what a salesperson is. It's not necessarily a selling person. This could be the purchasing manager. Um, I've seen that as well. Um, divorce or family matters. And clearly this also plays into the 34% that indicate financial difficulties, right? Because they're sort of related in there. Irritability, suspiciousness, or defensiveness. This is a very important red flag. If someone is particularly touchy about a subject that involves the business, that potentially could be a red flag that something is up because they're particularly stressed out maybe about the fraud that they've committed or the fraud that they're thinking about committing. Let's see, we have additions. We have someone who's complained about poor pay. And remember, this is part of the fraud triangle, right? Uh, past employment problems. Uh, refusal to take vacations, and I've already given you the example why banks require one week continuous vacation at a time. Um, organizational pressure, social isolation, uh, lack of authority, the person's perception that they don't have the authority. So I think these are super important red flags that can guide you, if you're familiar with them, towards opportunities to actually alleviate or minimize the risk of potential fraud within your organization. Um, let's see, detecting accounting fraud. So in terms of accounting fraud, 40% of fraud is reported by tips, both from internal and external sources. That's the biggest bulk whereby fraud is identified is the uh, TIPS method. Of those 40%, 53% of those are from employees. So the bulk of people who report TIPS are employees within your own company. The next biggest percent is 21% from external vendors. So TIPS is a really great source of determining if there is fraud or an indication of that. The possible prevention for that is an anonymous ethics, excuse me, obviously I can't say that, an anonymous ethics or whistleblower hotline. It should be managed by a third party and it should report up to senior management, the compliance department and the board about what types of tips are they coming in about a particular person or entity, um, how are they resolved. So an anonymous ethics or whistleblower hotline is critical to addressing the first, um, the first where 40% of um, fraud claims come or notifications come from tips. That's very, very important. Tone at the top is also very important. If your senior managers or your company president or CEO are not talking about fraud, that is an indicator that that's an area that you really need to have the company bone up in. Because what senior managers do and say 
impacts what everyone else in the company thinks or believes or considers an important um, message or something that they need to think about. So in terms of fraud reporting, the next biggest percent after tips is internal audit. We're going to talk a little bit more about this in a couple of slides, but I did highlight that the eighth on the list is external auditors. So yes, this is a shameless plug for having a good internal audit department, as I am in fact an internal auditor and a chief audit executive, but it's really important that we consider what internal audit does differently from external audit so that they can identify these frauds that might be missed by your external auditors. Management review of financial statements, of the books, um, drilling down into the details can be very, very helpful to detect possible fraud. Sometimes internal departments do it. Some other department is doing something that looks suspicious and they're reporting that up. And then of course, there's the famous, but not very helpful, accidentally discovering fraud, right? It inadvertently crosses your desk and you think, hmm, that looks suspicious. So that's not great. That's not a great mechanism. It's certainly not something that you can help or promote. Some other ideas to prevent these type of frauds up front are being proactive in detecting fraud. And I think the internal audit department is very, very well positioned to do that. We recommend that anti-fraud training is uh, made available and in fact compulsory for employees. Uh, that might include code of conduct. In the best practices for code of conduct are that the employees, all employees, certify or sign that they are complying with the code of conduct annually. FCPA training is a great example of fraud related training and anti-bribery and corruption training, also related to FCPA, but slightly different because it talks a little bit more about some other avenues. So these are examples of anti-fraud training for common types of fraud. Strong auditing and internal controls, and we're gonna delve into that in a few minutes. Diligent hiring practices. You might not think this is obvious, but clearly if you're hiring the right type of person, they're more likely to raise tips they're more likely to not have a background that indicates there might have been some type of fraud or malfeasance at a prior employee, employment and employee support programs. Okay, let's shift to the second polling question. Thank you. So expense fraud relates to which of the following? Uh, forging or fraudulent receipts, inflated expense claims, double claiming of the same expense, hiding the true nature of the expense claimed or all of the above. So while we're while you are logging in and getting making sure that you get your CPE, I'm going to tell you the famous story of the red hat. Hopefully you've heard about this if you're doing any type of fraud investigation. There was, and I don't know if this is actually true, but it's certainly prevalent in fraud circles. Um, there was an employee of a company who traveled unexpectedly to a cold climate and they went out and they purchased a red hat. When it came to filing their expense reports, they submitted the red hat receipt um, and it was denied by management as not being an approved or pre-approved expense. So they sent it back to the employee. The employee made some changes on their expense report and sent it back in to their manager with a note that said, find the red hat. So that's a very common story, but it illustrates one of the examples of expense reporting fraud. We given enough time, folks? Do we have enough for results? Excellent, perfect. Um, all of the above is definitely the correct answer, although each one of those other items is a component of expense fraud. Okay, preventing fraud and internal controls. So this alphabet soup is just a small sampling of the control frameworks. And internal controls, as was mentioned earlier, are super important in allowing the detection of and the prevention of 
fraud within an organization. You may be familiar with a couple of these. Um, COSO, which is the, um, the combined operational statement for organizations, that's very, very common. It's been updated recently. It makes it much more complex. I think that makes it a deterrent for people to use. COBIT, which is an IT controls um, framework, ISO controls, which relate not only to fraud and accounting, but many other aspects like quality and manufacturing for an organization. Uh, FIRMA is actually the risk management standard that was initiated in Europe that's often used there um, from the Risk Management Association. And OGEC refers to their Red Book number two, which talks about government's risk, DRC, government risk and compliance capability model. So these are just some of the possible types of control frameworks that can be implemented in an organization. Okay, we're gonna talk a lot about COSO because it's really the most predominant framework, especially in the United States. As many of you know, this was developed in 1992 and then recently expanded in 2013. It now includes 17 different elements. It used to be much smaller. And if anyone has studied for a CPA exam or a CIA, Certified Internal Auditor exam, you will recognize this acronym for the five main and original components of COSO, that is crime. Control environment, risk factors, information and communications, monitoring and existing controls. So if nothing else, you'll have learned the acronym CRIME or refreshed your memory in terms of the items that are identified through this COSO framework. This, by the way, is the 2013 uh, edition of the CUBE and um, it is available, credit goes to the COSO and the Treadway Commission for publishing that. There is no charge to retrieve that and the elements. They are all about publishing this and making sure that people are using that. So below the five elements of COSO, there are now 17 different items and activities under the CRIME acronym, right? Control, risk, control activities, information, and monitoring activities. Um, there are basically, when you're looking at COSO, three types of organizational objectives um, or organizational items that support COSO. One of them is the objectives of the organization. What is your business's objectives? What are their goals? What are their strategic goals? The second one is, how is your organization developed? What is the organizational structure of that? Um, how are their geospheres developed? management from one geosphere and another geosphere. How are the departments structured? So it's very, very detailed. And finally, what are the objectives? So objectives fall into components and components are the breakdown for what the company needs to do in order to achieve those organizational objectives. So the three main elements that COSO focuses on are objectives, they're the components, and finally the organizational structure. Things in objectives include tone at the top, which we've mentioned earlier. Um, the rows on the queue are the uh, five components. And finally, the organizational structure is the 17 dimensions, all of which lead, or excuse me, the organizational structure is the third dimension of the queue. And all of those lead to these 17 objectives with COSO, which is a lot of the information. Okay, the Sarbanes-Axley Act of 2002. Um, at this stage, I have to admit, I feel like I have that tattooed on me. I was around prior to SOX and I've implemented SOX at several large global firms. Um, we maybe have taken less eyes off the implementation and are now focused more on the verification, identifying new items. So as many of you know, um, there were a number of very high visibility cases in the early 2000s, which involved both financial statement fraud and other frauds. Um, this caused investors to lose face in audited reports and financial statements and disclosures. And Congress stepped in in 2002 to, with the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. So the Sarbanes-Oxley Act did two main things. It created the PCAOB, which replaces former self-regulation in the accounting 
firm industry. So clearly the accountants were not able to self-regulate and they ended up putting in a government body to provide oversight on what the accounting firms are doing themselves and making sure that items were enforced consistently across accounting firms. It also was designed to protect the public and investors from errors, fraud, and disclosure inaccuracy. So the PCAOB, the Public Company Accounting Reform and Investor Protection Act, which is actually another name for SOX, um, was implemented at that time. And most of us will be aware that they issue periodic or annual um, proclamations that indicate things that they have seen consistently wrong in the work that they are reviewing that has been audited or reviewed by accounting firms. So they'll tell you what the latest top topic is. An example of that is the recent under COVID, the PPP loans, right? So that is in the process of being reported for last year by companies. There have been some clear misstatements, inaccuracies, um, on financial disclosures related to those, and the PCAOB recently issued a proclamation for accounting firms to be specifically conscious of this and focus their attention if their client has a PPP loan. That's one example. Many companies involved in these accounting scandals 20 years ago ended up filing bankruptcy. So that meant that effectively their clients, their customers, their employees did not get paid as a result of the financial condition they were left. In some cases, that harmed investors who lost all of the value in their investment. So there's a lot riding on internal controls and the effective implementation of SOX. Some of those companies involved in the um, scandals prior to Sarbanes-Oxley, you would be familiar with, WorldCom, Enron, um, Tyco International, which was a famous one, Adelphi Peregrine Systems. So there are lots of really large accounting scandals that occurred at the time. In some cases, the fines have been in the hundreds of million, and in one case, billion dollars. People went to jail. That was also enshrined in the act. So president of company got 20 years. Um, the vice president got 15 years. So there are some really severe penalties to not complying with Sarbanes-Oxley and not having the appropriate internal controls implemented for your business. Okay, an ounce of prevention, a pound of cure. So we're all familiar with preventative measures, which are designed to avoid the fraud before it actually occurs. Detective measures, which find fraud after it occurs and identify missing, missing assets, invalid transactions. I think a good annual risk assessment is key to figuring out what's going on within the organization and where both the external and internal auditors should be focusing their attention on. A risk assessment identifies is the process whereby which you identify hazards and risk factors that impact the ability to achieve the company's or the entity's strategic goals. You analyze and evaluate those risks, and you determine within your organization appropriate ways to eliminate, remediate, reduce, or control the risk. So I think this is absolutely critical. You should be looking in the risk assessment, which should be done annually before the next year's planning occurs, um, at internal processes and controls, the organizational structure, and segregation of duties among various personnel. The one proviso to all of the things that you might be doing or considering as a preventative measure, a detective measure, or in the risk, as a result of the risk assessment is the cost benefit analysis of controls versus cost. So this is an example where the businesses are probably gonna push back if the solution is so costly for fraud um, or for errors that might be very de minimis in value. I should also say that that is going to look different between internal and, aud and external auditors because external auditors have a much higher materiality level, whereas internal auditors can really dive down into the weeds in departments and things like that. But there are, there are cases definitely where a company has looked at what the solution or remediation might be and in fact determine it is not cost effective 
to implement that solution in order to remediate the risk that, or fraud that might potentially be identified. Okay, preventing fraud. So these are some fairly obvious ways of preventing fraud. Some of them tie back to the type of people that would commit fraud and some of the things that we talked about on an earlier slide. Segregation of duties, workflow and approval of transactions before they're entered, delegation of authority. So I gave you the example of the purchasing fraud where someone was trying to go around the delegation of authority because they didn't want to get additional approvals for their purchase orders. So they broke them up into smaller chunks. Physical controls, locks, badge scanners, safe, uh, cameras, motion or heat sensors, and restricted access. So for most of us who are working from home, these don't necessarily apply, but they might at the point that we get back into the venue. Computer passwords, access controls, and two-level verification or authentication. And finally, employee screening and training. And you'll recall that we touched on that earlier, that if you conduct a background check for all new employees and a reference check, that's an excellent, easy way to make sure that you're screening the inbound employees for various items. Um, I've had uh, companies or clients that actually conduct an employee background screening against OFAC or LEIE on a monthly basis for all employees to make sure they're not debarred or excluded from various transactions. So that can be also an ongoing monthly thing. And we have talked about training. So that is. Um, the fraud training that we talked about, Code of Conduct, ABAC, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, or UK NG Bribery Act, and then training on policies within the company. Most companies, whether they're domestic or local or global, have policies that talk about different types of fraud or um, other related items like ethics and the Code of Conduct, and that training should be regularly offered and in some cases, it should be repeated annually. A little bit like anti-sexual harassment training, which is required, at least in the state of California, to occur once a year for every employee. Um, mandating that type of thing, um, while I know people can perceive they have training overload, is very helpful in preventing fraud. Okay, detecting fraud. So this is the after the fact item. Um, a couple of these are very, very common in the field, surprise cash counts, surprised or scheduled physical inventories, um, account and bank reconciliations. So the expectation is specifically for bank reconciliations that they are done each and every month before the books are closed. Now, I know in many cases now we can actually do them on an ongoing basis. The staff can do it that way. But at a minimum, these need to complete before the month end close occurs in the event you discover something unusual. Um, account reconciliations, they can be queued so that you have some monthly, maybe in very high transaction or visibility accounts, and some quarterly or semi-annually in accounts where there's very little activity um, such that the reconciliation can be easily complete or you're not likely to see high instances of fraud or malfeasance in those accounts. Um, using financial planning and analysis tools is a great way to identify fraud on financial statements. So what was the budget for the actual for that department? What is year over year metrics versus quarter over quarter metrics? Um, building budgets from the bottoms up and not taking a, this year's budget plus 5% as next year's budget and detailed trend analysis. All of these things will allow you to look at these items and determine if there's possible instances of fraud that warrant um, investigation, if, especially if there's changes from what you expected year over year, quarter over quarter, or budget to actual. Just a reminder in detecting fraud, internal audit has two types of audits. Most people aren't aware of this. They have the standard internal audit. They also conduct operational audits. Um, that has been a fairly new item for internal auditors in the last five or six years. Um, and internal audit has some real advantages over the external auditors. Um, you can increase the sample size, and they most often do. Definitely, there is a difference in the materiality limits for internal auditors versus external auditors. 
And internal auditors really know the business. Often they've worked in other areas or they are rotating through internal audit. And so they're very familiar with what should be occurring and what looks unusual. Okay, auditors versus internal and external. So this is gonna be my soapbox um, because I think there's a lot that's not being done currently to either prevent or detect fraud. So my hints are be skeptical if you're an auditor, keep your eyes open, ask question, the rule of threes, understand the business. And this is particularly tough if you change external auditors or if they are bringing in the entry level auditor from the external accountant to perform the audit, all of the details, because they're just not going to be familiar with your business. And sometimes those folks change annually. So that's super important to being an effective auditor. Um, are people looking at the forest versus the trees? This is also something that internal audit focuses more on the trees and external auditors focuses more on the forest. Be sure to follow up if you're auditing item, look for red flags, watch people do specific items in their daily jobs, interview multiple people on the same topic or question, and use data analysis tools that are available. Benford's Law, Sampling, trend analysis, there are quite a few of electronic or other tools that are available to allow you to crunch big data and potentially show some outcomes. So I will say that the purchasing fraud that I um, identified earlier, that was done through an analysis of all purchase orders over a specific time period. So I didn't do a sample size, I just did all of them. And immediately using Benford's Law and trend analysis, um, the electronic program I used was able to identify some anomalies. And those are what caused me to focus in on what are the details behind those anomalies and was there potentially a fraud. So please use the tools and keep your eyes wide open. I know people tend to get buried in their individual task and that results in them losing focus. Third polling question. Okay, what internal controls framework do, does your organization, company, or employer use? COSO, COBIT, ISO, the European Risk Management um, Firma, and don't know or unsure. And there's no right or wrong answer to this question as you're going through it. And again, make sure you answer so that you can get credit for this and get the CPEs that you deserve for sitting through this. And when you're ready to close it out to make sure everyone has an opportunity to answer, would you go ahead and show the results? Okay, COSO, um, COVID, I'm surprised that that's not, whoops. Hmm, COVID, I'm surprised that that's not higher because a lot of organizations do use it. ISO, uh, no one uses FIRMA in the audience and don't know or unsure. So that's totally acceptable. And I appreciate everyone's interest. The COSO framework 50% does not surprise me at all. Ellen, and just one reminder, we we do only have a couple more minutes left yep. for this presentation slot. So just a time reminder there. Thank you. Global considerations. Hopefully you're all familiar if you work in a multinational firm or are auditing a firm like that uh, of the transparency index. So this, this is an annual rating. It is publicly available. All of the material is publicly available and it can be publicized. It just points auditors towards companies that have countries, excuse me, that have higher risk for, um, for fraud based on the country that they're in. So if you have companies in Mexico that you're auditing um, or companies in Sudan that you're auditing, those might be at a higher risk for fraud 
than say Sweden um, or some other countries. So that's just something to consider to give you a framework. Okay, global accounting fraud. So this is the percent of corruption cases and you can see it ranks from Asia all the way through the United States in those countries. Um, there are many aspects to global accounting fraud. Cyber fraud is certainly on the increase. That includes the famous president or CEO email, ransomware. Fraud can be committed anywhere in the world. It's important to allow for cultural differences. Um, there is often fair value fraud, and that's very subjective. Purchasing and accounts payable fraud, payment fraud via banking systems, and the general reminder that if it's too good to be true, it probably is. And finally, I think we have the fourth polling question. Does your company or employer utilize technology to help auditors locate or identify fraud? So some, some examples of technology include artificial intelligence, RPA, um, automated monitoring, anomaly detecting protocols, audit analysis software, excuse me, on an analysis software. So just have a few minutes to answer that. And the options are yes, no, and not sure. And when it looks like we start tapering down, if the results can be shown, that would be great. So yes, 38, no, 31, and not sure, 31%. So it's good to see the use of technology, especially if you're working at a larger company where it really helps you identify what the risks and the fraud potential are. Can you? Thank you. Okay, some examples of cyber fraud, which we briefly touched on. The famous letter from the president to please cut a check immediately, very common. Uh, change of remittance information in accounts payable, the use of ransomware, which we've seen in the United States, several large examples recently, cryptocurrencies, blockchain, which is often not understood by auditors, and the general misinformation or reputational cyber fraud. And then some considerations for you to look at as you're considering if you are a global company. Risk assessment, do it in multiple languages, make it anonymous. There are many regional and country-specific anti-bribery, anti-corruption laws. What are the consequences of committing fraud in different countries? Are your processes centralized or dispersed? What is the cost benefit? And it's helpful to have auditors who can speak languages other than English involved in those audits. That being said, I have audited revenue recognition in China, although I don't speak much Chinese, and I've done it in several other countries, although I may not be proficient in those languages. So it can be done. It's just much easier if you have someone who's proficient in that. And that wraps us up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ellen. Sorry for the, uh, the, the the long pause there, having a little trouble with my mouse. But uh, that was a fantastic presentation, and uh, we appreciate you joining us. And you can see more information on Ellen here and her involvement at RGP. And once again, um, RGP being a partner of Lease Query, a global uh, management consulting firm, you can find out more information about RGP here on the slide. And you can also find more information about RGP at their website, which uh, is rgp.com. And if any of you have questions specifically for Ellen, you can find her email address.
at the bottom, ellen.class at rgp.com. So we appreciate you joining us, and uh, maybe we'll see you back next session or next Excellent. summit that we have. Thank you.